but we're continuing on our series through Exodus. If you turn to Exodus chapter 6. We're here in the story of God's deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt. Uh, They are enslaved there. Moses met with uh, God at the burning bush, has uh, returned to Egypt. His first appearance to Pharaoh went uh, badly, it seemed. Uh, Pharaoh increased the work uh, for God's people. We're going to start reading uh, from verse 10. We'll split up the reading. It's quite a long one. We're going to read from uh, 6 verse 10 uh, to verse uh, 27. And then after our next song, uh, we'll complete the reading. So from 6 verse 10, let's listen to God's words to us. So the Lord said to Moses, go in, tell Pharaoh king of Egypt to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me, for I am of uncircumcised lips? But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge about the people of Israel and about Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of their father's houses, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, Hanok, Palu, Hezron, and Carmi. These are the clans of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jachin, Zohar, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the clans of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The years of the life of Levi being 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shimei by their clans. The sons of Kohath, so that's the second son of Levi, Amran, Izhar, Ebron, and Uziel. The years of the life of Kohath being 133 years. And the sons of Merari, Mali, and Mushi. These are the clans of the Levites according to their generations. So Amran, that was the first son of Kohath, took as his wife Jochebed, his father's sister, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, The years of the life of Amram being 137 years. The sons of Izhar, Korah, Nepheg, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel, Mishael, Elsaphan, and Sithri. Aaron took as his wife Elisheba, the daughter of Aminadab, and the sister of Nashon. And she bore him Nadab, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. The sons of Korah, Asir, Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the clans of the Korahites. Eleazar, Aaron's son, took as his wife one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phineas. These are the heads of the fathers' houses of the Levites by their clans. These are the Aaron and Moses, to whom the Lord said, Bring out the people of Israel from the land of Egypt by their hosts. It was they who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the people of Israel from Egypt. This Moses and this Aaron. Amen. On the day when the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, the Lord said to Moses, I am the Lord. Tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I say to you. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of this out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. 
And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Amen. So it's the the 7th of January, here we are, 2024, a new year. Um, I find that the the change of year kind of a strange thing, because that that word new, it makes me feel like there's something fresh about it all. You know, 2024 feels like a blank slate, a, a year waiting to happen, it's full of possibilities, full of dreams. But then I remember, actually, I actually dragged 2023 into 2024 with me. And so with me come some wonderful things like deepened friendships and skills learned or wisdom built up, but also comes with me frustrations, difficulties, worries. They come too. And, and perhaps one of those for you is that the sadness of seeing friends and family still not believing in Jesus. Over Christmas, perhaps you had high hopes of it all. They'd, they'd come to one of the services, they'd hear the gospel, they'd turn to you and say, what must I do to be saved? But then the excuses came in, or, or they did come, but all they said was, yeah, that was nice, thanks. And we just long for the results, don't we? We long for our friends to listen and to be saved. Wouldn't it be great if we just had a long list of adult baptisms for this year? But as that interest fades, it It can be discouraging. But here at the beginning of 2024, Exodus 6 and 7, this seemingly small, you know, the insignificant feeling moments in the the whole sweep of Exodus, they give us God's perspective on things. They make us realize we are not God. The Lord is. He's in charge. Because Moses actually had a similar longing. A longing that Pharaoh would listen. That Pharaoh would respond to God rightly. We had it at 6 verse 12, Moses said to the Lord, Behold, the people of Israel have not listened to me. How then shall Pharaoh listen to me? For I am of uncircumcised lips. And then again it's repeated in verse 30. But Moses said to the Lord, Behold, I am of uncircumcised lips. How will Pharaoh listen to me? How will Pharaoh listen to me? Moses longs for God's word to penetrate the heart of Pharaoh. To get to the right place for the right thing to happen. And that's what we want too, but... But this isn't a passage of happy endings. Instead, first we need to see it's a passage actually of a shock result. A shock result. 7 verse 13 at the end of our passage. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. You know, Moses, he was so up for getting his message to Pharaoh. He was wanting to hit home with the speech and his miracles and God's people be free. It's kind of bish, bash, bosh. It's going to happen. But that's not what happens. Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them. Imagine walking out of that meeting. You can imagine if Moses hadn't listened to God, you can imagine him feeling pretty confused about it all. Just going over and over, what's just happened? We did the speech, you know, we did the miracles. and Boy, they were good miracles. We nailed it. So so what went wrong? Why did Pharaoh still say no? Perhaps you've walked out of conversations similarly with friends thinking, you know, I nailed it. I gave the best answer I could. I pointed them to Jesus. I was gentle. I wasn't, didn't get into an argument. And then it's nothing. It's, It's blank. No response. And for Moses, as he he walked out of that meeting, I reckon there could have been two temptations for him. One was to think, I'm just not the right guy. You know, that old worry of Moses rears its head again. I can't speak, I'm not good at this. If God is going to save Israel, he needs another savior. And the other might have been, well, maybe Pharaoh's just too tough. Maybe Pharaoh is a bigger match for God than he predicted. Perhaps God is just out of his depth a bit here. 
And perhaps you thought both of those. One about the Savior, Jesus, maybe he's just not the right guy in the end. Or, secondly, God, he can't do it. Well, let's see how Exodus begins to answer those concerns. Firstly, the shock result doesn't mean the wrong Savior. Okay, the shock result doesn't mean the wrong savior. Here in Exodus 6, it feels like a bit of a change of momentum in the, in the book as a whole. You know, up until verse uh, 14, the, the, the writer's been uh, setting the scene over these chapters. We've had Moses' birth, we've had his commission, meeting the Lord at the burning bush, we've had the, the situation getting harder with Pharaoh, forcing the slaves uh, to work harder. And then verse 14, we get this kind of break, we get this genealogy. This list of Moses and Aaron's families and ancestors, you know, it's name after name, wasn't it? And then in chapter 7, things kick off again. And we get into the main section, we get the plagues, we get the Passover, it's, it's all going. And it's in this break, we get the writer showing us, God hasn't got the wrong guy. He hasn't got the wrong savior. Moses and Aaron are exactly who he wanted Now, we've known that through chapters 1 to 4. You know, Moses was miraculously saved. He was educated with Pharaoh. He had this life as a shepherd. He had extraordinary experience of God coming close. But here we see again. And first, we're shown these guys are legit. Okay, they are truly part of God's people. Totally legitimate saviors. That's what this genealogy is doing here. You know, Moses, he's turned up out of the desert after 40 years there with Aaron. And he he could have been anyone. But no, these guys are true Israelites. They're from the tribe of Levi. That's the whole uh, point, isn't it? Their ancestors are known. Verse 16, Levi, his second son, was called Kohath. Verse 18, Kohath's first son was Amram. Verse 20, Amram was Aaron and Moses' father. Now, it's a genealogy with warts and all, isn't it? Amram's wife is his aunt. That's not good. Some of the names mentioned have pretty infamous endings like Korah and Nadab and Abihu. But it shows us Moses and Aaron, they are legitimate members of God's people. Now, this mattered for Israel. You know, in our society, heritage doesn't matter so much, does it? Where you were born, who your parents are, we we don't really care. Show me your qualifications. Show me what you can do. That's what we care about. But in those days, your ancestry mattered. God had made promises to Abraham and his family, so being part of the family mattered. Now Moses and Aaron's ancestry was clear, part of God's people. So that's first box ticked. But more than that, uh, they're obedient to God too. These guys now had the character to match. You know, Moses, he starts as a stumbling, doubting man, doesn't he? When at the burning bush, he he answered back to God about his abilities. Later on, he even accused God of evil. And again in verse 30, we see him questioning what God can do. But then we see a change about him. 7 verse 6, Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Something had clicked. There's faith, there's trust, there's obedience. It's like one of those moments in a film after the montage you know, you, know you, you get that really weak, kind of skinny guy. He has uh, two-minute montages, years of training, you know, the press-ups, the sit-ups, the running, um, uh, all to an awesome soundtrack. And then at the end, he's like totally stacked and can lift a car with his fingers. And it, it, it's like that film character, Moses, has now changed. He's, he's becoming the leader God wants him to be. God's got through to him. You know, often when we look back at leaders who failed, we, we can just kind of see the line of car crashes in their wake, their compulsive lying or their, their inability to lead or make decisions, desire for power, but not with these guys, not with Moses and Aaron. They had become the real deal. They did just as the Lord commanded them. They're legitimate and they're obedient and they're also empowered by God. At the end of our section, Moses and Aaron head, head back to Pharaoh and here we see God with them. Aaron throws his staff and it turns into a snake. It's, it's, it's pretty mental, isn't it? But somehow, by some dark witchcraft, we don't know what, the magicians do the same. And here we see God's power is like no other, verse 12. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. You know, it's like that moment when you're having an argument with someone and you just lay the killer blow. You know, your logic is perfect, your timing bang on, and, and there's just nothing more they can say. That's this moment. 
They're snakes have just been eaten up and gone. It's kind of the killer blow. God wins. Here is the miraculous right in front of Pharaoh and his magicians, and it's all come through Moses and Aaron. These guys are empowered by the living God. They've got his total stamp of approval. They're legitimate, they're obedient, and empowered. God is with them like no one else. So the shock result of Pharaoh not listening doesn't mean the wrong savior, does it? God had exactly the right saviors in place. And how much more is it true of Jesus Christ? Jesus, just think, he had the perfect heritage. He could trace it all the way back. He was the son of God, in fact. From the tribe of Judah, the line of David, the promised king. He fitted the credentials perfectly. His papers were in order. At the the gates of the heavenly palace, he would be waved right in. And also, he's perfect in obedience and speech. He never strayed from God's path. He didn't need a montage. He was always following God's ways, always trusting, living for God's glory. He couldn't be faulted. There's no stain on his record, no skeleton in the cupboard. And thirdly, there's never been someone on earth more empowered like him, as there? Someone who's more declared to have God's presence with him. Miracles like no other. He calmed the storm, fed the 5,000, healed the sick, cast out demons, raised the dead, even rising from the dead himself. Here is the right savior. There's no fault in him, no chink in his armor. And so when people reject him, that doesn't mean we've got the wrong guy. And we know this, we know Jesus is exactly who our world needs. We know he's the one who saves, who lived for us, died for us, rose again for us and is coming back for us. His cross fully dealt with all our sin. His resurrection beat the grave and bound up the devil. His victory is ours. You know, that's why when we're at evangelistic events or a friend asks about the gospel or about Jesus, we can be so pumped because we know God has got the perfect savior for them. So often Mary and I have had discussions about friends or family. We say they just need Jesus. That's what it's like, isn't it? That there's this perfect savior that loves us, that died for his own. He could transform the lives of the people we know now and for eternity. And we sit next to them, I don't know, in the carol service. And we're thinking, how could they not become a Christian now? How could they ignore him now? We know The shock result doesn't mean the wrong savior. But even after they've heard the beauty of the music, they've seen the wonder of God's people together, they've even sung the message of the angels, they've heard of Jesus Christ, even then we find people not believing. So is the problem then with God? Is he out of his depth? Well, secondly, the shock result doesn't mean a weak God. The shock result doesn't mean a weak God. And firstly, we just need to see that it's only a powerful God that could actually turn Pharaoh around. Moses had been worried that, that Pharaoh wouldn't listen. Why? Because of his own lips. God, I can't speak properly. But Moses was looking at the wrong person and the wrong organ. It wasn't about Moses' lips. This was about Pharaoh's heart. His heart, it's, it's like a stone. There's no life here, no beating. There's no engagement or softness. At this, at this point, you kind of want a, a heart that's like a potter's clay, damp and soft, ready to be shifted and shaped by God's artistic hands. And instead, this is hard like granite, impossible to chisel away at, let alone get gently molded. It's impenetrable. And so Pharaoh didn't listen. Moses came and Moses went and Pharaoh remained unchanged. And why is his hard heart? Well, because of his sin. It's sin that kills a heart. It's sin that makes it turn from flesh to stone. Now, we'll come on to God's hardening in a moment. But we've got to see, first of all, that it starts with us. Pharaoh's heart is already hard. We've seen it in chapter 5. Moses already turned up. He's asked for his people to leave and worship God. And what does Pharaoh do? He not only says no, he then goes and makes everything harder for God's people. I am God, he says. I make the rules. No one comes in here and tries to steal my slaves. With all that's going on in front of him, Pharaoh, he just won't give in. He won't listen. 
Sin, it comes from Pharaoh. It's from his hard heart. He's responsible for it. And this is why we need a powerful God when it comes to saving people. We are not in the position to save ourselves or to save our friends. As, as Paul puts it in Ephesians 2, we were dead in our transgressions. Dead. Dead people can't make themselves live again. We need a God who can get right into hearts, breathe new life into them. Only a powerful God can save. And yet Pharaoh still stays obstinate. So is our God weak? Are our hearts too far for him, too hard for him, too bad for him? Is he powerless in the face of our sin? Well, here comes the bigger shock of the passage. 7 verse 3 but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen. Not only is the result a shock, here we find God is actually ensuring it happens. Far from being powerless, we see God, his his power in action. But rather than in salvation, God here is working in judgment. Listen to how John Calvin puts it, I think very helpfully. The hardness of heart is the sin of man. That's what we've just seen. The hardness of heart is the sin of man, but the hardening of the heart is the judgment of God. The hardness of heart is the sin of man, but the hardening of the heart is the judgment of God. Judgment of God, what does that mean? In response to a human being's sin, to them having a hard heart, God's just punishment is to harden them further. We see that throughout Scripture. Part of God's judgment on sin is to give people over to their sin. We see it again and again in Romans 1. People chose to worship false gods, so God gives them up to their sin, to their debased minds, to their worldly passions. So as God says about Pharaoh, I will harden Pharaoh's heart, he's saying, Pharaoh has a hard heart. He's decided on the way of sin, so as a just punishment, I'm going to confirm that choice. I'm not going to hold back that sin anymore, but let him pursue it headlong. And we see it in our own day, don't we? As we choose a life away from God, so the pit we dig for ourselves gets deeper and deeper. You know, depravity in our society takes a darker and darker form in ways I don't even think about. We know we've seen it particularly in the area of sexuality. People say to God, I don't want to listen to you. And so in a sense, he says to them, okay, if that's what you want, here are some sound excluders. So you don't even hear whispers of what is good and right and true. Here we see God's power He is getting involved in hearts, just not in the way we expected. The the shock result doesn't mean a weak God. So what that means is that as a friend says to us, yeah, I don't believe the whole God thing, there are a few things going on. First, as we've seen, there's plain old sin. Even in the face of all that they've heard and seen, people will just stubbornly hold on to sin. Why? Because their hearts are hard. But now we see there might be something else going on. We might also be seeing the judgment of God at work. As someone becomes entrenched in their hard heart, we're seeing God saying, okay, here's what you asked for, further and further distance from my love. And this can be hard to see, can't it? It can leave us on the floor in tears. Friends, you've heard the gospel, but just don't want anything to do with it. That slow drift of the person who was so central to church and now they're just too busy or or made different friends or just won't pick up your call. They just won't listen. Their heart is hard and God in his power might be hardening it. Now I say might because actually we can't see beneath the surface, can we? We don't know when God is hardening and when he's softening some of the time. We can't predict But the possibility of God's judgment does need to be in our minds and hearts because it helps us understand that God is not a weak God. He's not a God who just can't be bothered. He's always a God who is in some kind of relationship with us. However much uh, uh, people may want to, they cannot do life with zero reference to God. He is always at work, always present to them, whether in judgment or in grace. 
He isn't a weak God. Now this truth of God's judgment, I know, is one of those truths that can sting, can't it? It doesn't always sit easily with us. And I I think it's partly because God shows us we're not God. Because we might immediately jump to the conclusion that it's just not fair. Why should God save the Israelites but not Pharaoh? Surely that's unfair on Pharaoh. Now, although we struggle with this sovereign decision of God, the one thing it isn't is unfair. Because punishment and judgment is the one thing sin really does deserve. Right from the start in the Garden of Eden, death is the penalty of sin. At the heart of our response of unfair might actually be thinking our sin isn't that bad. It isn't really rejecting the God of life. It isn't really an affront to his holiness. It isn't really horrifically damaging to me and to the other image bearers God has made. We all actually deserve to be saved. And as we level that accusation against God, what we're just saying is we're not that bad, and God, you've got it wrong. Now, the mystery of God's sovereign choice, I've said, is difficult, but as we wrestle with it, we mustn't accuse God of doing wrong. We mustn't let slip like Moses did in chapter five, calling what God does evil. But what God is doing is showing us that his world is more complex than we first thought. We think it's easy. Don't we? we think it's just there's sin and God saves. But God wants us to see there's more going on. Because just to finish, even if the shock result doesn't mean the wrong savior, nor a weak God, what it does show is his wonderful purposes. The shock result shows his wonderful purposes. Verse four. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Here in in the Exodus, in God's great moment of salvation of his people, there are other things going on. Here is the mystery of God's work in the world. As we see people holding fast in their sin, God is showing others the power of his salvation. As Pharaoh's heart stays rock solid, so God is preparing to show other Egyptians his majesty. They shall know that I am the Lord. You know, somehow in the midst of the pain of what's going on with one person we know, there are loads of other people for whom we have no idea what's going on. Paul says something similar in Romans 9. He says this, What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? But why? In order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he's prepared beforehand for glory. What's he saying? Perhaps as we see judgment on one person, we begin to realize the extent of his mercy on others and even on you and me. You know, as we we look at Pharaoh, as we see his hard heart, and we're going to see it all the more over these coming chapters of Exodus, as we see God's judgment and his sin, may it start to shine a light on the extraordinary grace of God shown to us. We are no better than Pharaoh. Our hearts are not somehow more malleable because we've made it like that. It's not that he was dead in his heart and we're just, we're just sick, we just need a little less help from God. No way, our hearts were like his. And yet God has shown grace upon grace to us. His love has been poured into our dead, stone-like hearts. We've received the treasures of heaven, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. We've come to Christ himself in the kingdom of glory. All showered upon us because of his kindness. This is where, in a sense, it's unfair. We don't deserve it. And yet God has decided to be merciful to us. The shock result shows us God's wonderful purposes all the more. He's at work in ways we just can't see. As David said this morning, in any one thing, God's doing a thousand things. And so as we find ourselves up against the frustrating, 
heartbreaking experience of people rejecting God and his savior. And may we respond in two ways. Firstly, may we be in awe of this God. Here is a God who has given us so much, a perfect savior, a glorious gospel, even given it to us. But also, he is a God more glorious and powerful than we could imagine. He is the one who has power over hearts. He is the one who gives and takes away. He is the one who will be glorified, whether through those people he's been merciful to or those who've received his judgment as they deserve. And he has wonderful purposes, even if we can't see them. Whatever happens, he is the Lord. But also secondly, may we never give up. As we feel the pain once again of a loved one walking away from God, may this lead us to pray like mad. To be on our knees again and again for them. The only one who can save them is the one who can change their hearts. The only one who can bring them to Christ is the one who can raise the dead. We trust in a sovereign God tonight. We don't trust in our own methods. We don't trust in our own presentations. Yes, we want to share the gospel as well as we can. Yes, we want to point to to Jesus and answer questions. God uses his gospel to save. But in the end, the power all lies with him. We've known his power in our lives. We know he raised uh, my heart from death to life and your heart. And so like John Newton was famed to say, we know two things very clearly. I am a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. Let's look to him whatever the results. Amen.